Father, we come to you as we are, broken and in so much need of help. We ask you, Lord, to take away any and all distractions that can separate us from uh, your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts today. I thank you for the message, and I thank you that you uh, have brought us here together today. And I ask, Lord, that uh, may it be your voice that is heard and not my own. May you be able to sanctify my words through your Holy Spirit. Help me to remember the things you want me to remember, forget or skip the things that you don't want me to say. May I be true to your word. And may we be changed and challenged and move to a closer, more intimate relationship with you. We have, because we have spent time in your word today. We ask these things believing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So today we go back to our series that we put a stop to it because of communion. We go back to our series on the Ten Loving Words, the Ten Loving Words, uh, also known as the Ten Commandments. Uh, this relationship that the, the husband that God wants to have with his bride, the church, or Israel, be it Israel of old and Israel of today. Uh, and so today we resume that series, and we are transitioning from, from the uh, vertical relationship of the bride with the husband, because we uh, have already finished, the, you could say, the, the first tablet. And now we are moving to the horizontal relationships, the relationships with others, which are very important as well. They're the, the, the family relationships. And the, the most intimate of these other relationships, these horizontal relationships, is truly the, the relationship of the family unit. Because that's where all of us begin. We begin in a family unit. Be it that it was a good family unit, a strong family unit, or a dysfunctional family unit, or a non-existent family unit in some cases, we all begin there. We all begin at this uh, family unit. And families, we realize, are very important to God. You see, today I, or this week, I was planning on concentrating simply on, on the fifth commandment. And in my mind, it was going to be, the, the hardest part was going to be deciding how to arrange the information that I had already uh, compiled and all the thoughts that have come to mind while I was thinking about it through, uh, through the week. And I had all the information there, but when I sat down to put the sermon together, right away the Holy Spirit began to lead me in a different direction. And soon I realized that, that God did not want us to just go straight to honor your father and your mother. But before talking about honoring your father and your mother, we need to uh, talk about family. We need to talk about parenting. We need to talk about uh, our responsibility. As, our responsibility as, as parents. Because as parents, you have a responsibility. If you are a parent, if you have children, then you have a responsibility to those children, regardless of their age, uh, but especially if they are young, and especially if they're still living at home, then you are responsible for them. I was also thinking that I if you're considering getting married soon, then 
I would advise you to, to take a look at the family of your fiancé. You know, the relationship that she or he has with his parents or her parents. You know, what are, what is, what are the dynamics like? Do, do they love each other? Do they get along? Do they talk? Do they interact like adults? Uh, is there respect between them? Regardless of what happened in the past, regardless of if both parents were involved in the raising of the children or not, you know, even if you have been hurt by your parents at one point, you still should respect them today simply for the very fact that they are your parents. Without them, you wouldn't be here today. It doesn't matter if they were horrible to you in many ways. It doesn't matter if they punish you or if they ridicule you or if because of them you have low self-esteem today. It does not matter. It is thanks to them that you're here today. As dysfunctional as that family unit might have been, and in some cases, probably very dysfunctional, you are here today and you have an opportunity at heaven, you have an opportunity at eternal life because they brought you into the world. And that in itself is a reason to uh, respect them. That doesn't mean that you have to have a close relationship with them. That doesn't mean that you even can have an intimate relationship with them. That simply means that they're your parents. They gave birth to you. And uh, because of them, you are here. And that in itself alone, even if you never have a close relationship with them because of the pain or because of the abuse or because either, you know, physical abuse or sexual abuse or or emotional abuse that they cause you, you can still respect them. I really appreciate it when I met my wife, Kara, because I noticed the relationship that she had with her mom, who was the only one in the picture when I came to know Kara. Her father at this point was living in Washington, and so I didn't actually get to meet him until the wedding or right before the wedding. But I saw the, the way that she talked about her dad, even though her dad was uh, not fully connected and not fully supportive in many respects, uh, I, I noticed that she still respected him. And that is good. It's important to respect people. It's, uh, you don't have to agree with them in order to respect them. You don't have to have a close relationship with them. You can live in separate states, but I do appreciate that when she talks to him on the phone, she's respectful, that she you know, makes it a point once in a while to talk to him. And then I noticed the relationship that she had with her mom, and all of you met, uh, or most of you met her when she was here with us, living with us. And I appreciated that relationship. It's important for us to, to, to uh, consider these things if we are thinking of getting married to someone because they are going to be not just your future in-laws, but they're going to be your future family. <laughs> when you marry you, someone, you marry not just the person, but you marry the whole family. Like it or not, they are going to be your family for the rest of the time that you're married to this person, hopefully for life, and uh, you will be part of their family. And so we realize that family is the most basic structure of society from the beginning. Family. And so with that in mind, let's go to our text today which we're just going to glance over it because, like I told you, uh, the Holy Spirit led in a different direction. So what we are doing, this is part one, and we're going to divide it into two parts because it would have been impossible. Well, not impossible. I preach some really long sermons. But it, 
it, it's better if we divide it into two parts so that it's more digestible for those of you who are on a light diet. And so we are dividing it into two parts, and this is part one. And part one is uh, parents' responsibility to their children. Before we look at the children's responsibility to their parents, we have to look at the parents' responsibility to their children because uh, you are the adult. You are the one who should be setting the example to them and not the other way around. So let's go to our text. I'm getting off subject here. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. We're in verse uh, 12. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Fifth word or fifth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. It says, honor your what? Honor your father and your mother. So you have to honor both of them. That your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. And the New Testament talks about that this being the one commandment with, with a promise for the future. You know, honor your father and your mother. Not just honor your father, but you have to honor your mother. Not just honor your mother, but you have to honor your father as well. It's for many reasons that we're not going to get into. I'm glad that it, it separated them like that. And especially in our day and age, I'm glad that it doesn't say honor your parents. I'm glad that it says honor your father and your mother. That is important. God, you know, God is so wise and God knows the end from the beginning. So it says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Honor your father and your mother. What is the husband saying here? by saying, honor your father and your mother. And it's really very simple. What he's saying is, uh, not only do I want to have a close relationship with you as my bride, but I also want you to have a strong relationship with your family. I also want you to have a, a, a intimate relationship and a strong relationship with your parents because I care about families God cares about families did you know that God cares about families God cares about families and he says I care about families because families were planned my original plan for for this world was based on the family structure and so if we are going to talk about giving honor to someone, honor your father and your mother, we have to remember that honor, oh, hello, <laughs> we can only honor those who deserve our honor. The Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. That's what the Bible says. Give honor to whom honor is due. So it's interesting that it says, honor your father and your mother. What really is telling us is, honor your, your parents. Honor your family. I want to take you to the beginning because it's important for us to begin to understand this. Uh, and hopefully you understand it. Otherwise, we might have to sit together later. But we're going to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. You see, family was God's plan from the beginning. And that is why we're going to Genesis so that we can read it together. Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 28. We're just going to read the first part here. This is after God created uh, man and woman and then brought them together. And it says here, God, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. 
God blessed them, and God said to them, what did God say to them? It says, be fruitful and do what? Which is kind of the same thing, you know, if you're fruitful, you're multiplying, and if you're multiplying, you're being fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply and do what? Fill the earth and subdue the earth. And then it tells you a lot of things, you know, you have to be in control of, of the animals which I have created. But it says, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, God's commandment was multiplication. I want you to be fruitful and I want you guys as a family to multiply. In other words, I want you guys to have children. And the moment that a man and a woman come together in marriage, holy matrimony, and they have children, automatically you become parents. And we realize that this, this idea of becoming parents, this idea of multiplication, this idea of being fruitful is the right from God. Because God is the one who is telling them, you know, now that you're here, now that you're together, and after you're married, I want you guys to be fruitful and multiply and fill this earth. So the idea of family and the idea of giving, like begetting children and the idea of having children came from God. It was God's idea from the beginning for, for men and, to, and women to come together and to have children. In other words, God wanted them to become parents. But parenting is more than just having children. Would you agree with that? Parenting is more than just having children. Having children is the easy part. I mean, I know there's some people who struggle to have children, but for the majority of people, uh, you know, having children is actually the easy part. But parenting, leading them, instructing them, now that is a different, a different thing altogether. You see, God's multiplication design for men is, is not as, as the beast of the field. The beast of the field is just multiply. Multiply? That's all they do. You know, they come together and they multiply. Some more than others, but they come together and they multiply. Uh, without any really, it, just by instinct, they're doing it. They're not thinking about it. They're not thinking, oh, I'm going to raise, you know, these little bears and, and one day I'm going to be a grandpa bear. And, you know, no, it's just coming together and multiply. We, as human beings, because God gave us the ability to think, we are not supposed to just act like the beast of the field. In other words, the, the point of having this, this opportunity to, to multiply it with one another is not so that we just fill the earth without the knowledge of God. It's multiplying under the blessing of God. There's a multiplying that happens in this world today that is not under the blessing of God because it happens outside of marriage. There's a multiplying that happens in this world that it's, it's not uh, under God's blessing or plan because God is never mentioned in the home. And then there's also multiplying that happens within the church, within uh, families in the church, that it's also not God's plan because you have them and then you just bring them to church, but you never, as parents, guide them in the way that they should go. You never instruct them, you never share with them, you never teach them from young, you don't bring them up loving Jesus, knowing Jesus even at their early age, you don't uh, emphasize how they as children can have a relationship, active living relationship with Christ. You leave all the responsibility to the church, to the pastor, to the Sabbath school teachers, and you pretty much just wash your hands 
And that is not God's purpose either. So there is a multiplication. When I talk about multiplication, I'm talking about having children. There's a multiplication that honors God, and there's a multiplication that does not honor God. There's a multiplication that happens under the God's blessing, and there's a multiplication that happens uh, away from God's blessing because we do not consult with him, we do not follow his word, we do not even care what he has to say about parenting. So let's go together uh, so that we can talk about this. We're in Genesis. We're going to go to chapter 6. Now here in chapter 6, first we're going to look at this multiplication uh, without God's will. Multiplication without God's will, which, which truly multiplication without God's will is just incurring a curse upon you, upon your children and your children's children. And we see it here in chapter 6. Chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 1 uh, through 3, it says, Now it came about when men began to multiply. See, there's that word. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, the daughters were born to them. Now this, these are the people, when it talks about uh, men here, it's talking about those who, who were far from God because there were two groups from the beginning and it says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and instead of seeking God's blessing instead of doing what God had told them to do it says they took wives for themselves whomever they chose they didn't ask their parents advice they didn't say you know is this a, a good person for me to marry? Uh, what do you think about this? Do you, do you agree with this? They didn't ask themselves, does this honor God? They basically saw, they liked, and they grabbed. And they said, that's it, that's mine. Ooh, mine, mine, mine. They were doing things for themselves. They were not doing things to please God. This is a multiplication that brings a curse, not just upon you and your marriage, brings a curse upon your children. And as we can see on the text, it brings a curse upon the whole earth. Because people were doing it without consulting with God. They did not care what God had said to them. They did not care that these people did not believe in God, that these people did not worship God. They did not care that they were worshiping idols. They did not care that they were not keeping God's law. They just liked and they took for themselves and they multiplied together. Multiplication against God's will is a curse to the parents, it's a curse to the children, and it's a curse to the earth. Verse, the beginning of verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever. If they want to do whatever they want to do, if they do not want to consult with me, if they have complete disregard for what I want for them, which what God wants for us is the best. He wants to give us the best. He wants to shower us with gifts. So now let's look at multiplication under God's blessing. And it's in the same chapter, but we're going to read verse 8. Starting with verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of whom? The Lord and these are the records of the generations of Noah. It says, Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. And Noah walked with God. He cared for what God had to say. He was open to listening to God's word. It says, Noah became the father. In other words, he multiplied. He became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all 
though the flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, verse 13, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Makes it clear, this goes against my plan. They're going against my word. They're not even consulting with me. They do not care what they do. And so they're eventually, eventually, uh, punishment comes upon the earth. And God makes it clear, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Now let's skip over to verse 17 and verse 18. It says, Behold, I, even I, I am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. Verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Multiplication under God's will is a blessing to the individual, is a blessing to the parents, is a blessing to the family because even though Noah was the only righteous person on the whole earth, his family was blessed because of it. They entered into the ark. They were delivered. And even his son's wives were delivered. When we follow God, we become a blessing. God honors individuals and their families who honor him. He says here that he enters into a covenantal relationship with them as he did with Noah. God wants to enter into a covenantal relationship with you, my sister, my brother. He wants to have a covenantal marriage, spiritual marriage relationship with you. We've, we've been talking about this a lot here in the last couple months. But here's the thing. Without godly parents, children usually grow up without knowing God. The truth is that if there were no godly parents to guide us to Christ, to be an example to us, the great majority of us would probably not be here today. And especially if you grew up in church, that doesn't mean that you don't take detours when you are young. That doesn't mean that you don't stumble and fall. But having a strong foundation really helps later in life. But without godly parents, that would be impossible. After all, when, when kids are young, they look up to their parents. They're always looking up to their parents. You are your, your child's hero. When they think of the strongest man in the world, they think of you. Uh, up to a certain point in their lives, and then they realize that you are not the strongest man in the world. But up to a certain point, you are whom they look up to. And that's exactly what the Bible talks about. I want to take you now to Ephesians. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Because it's very interesting what it says here in this Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 3. It kind of re it's uh, repeating Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 12. We are in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It says, children, obey whom? Obey your parents in who? In the Lord. That, that's a, such an interesting thing. The, the bad thing is it doesn't give us uh, an explanation of what exactly that means. Obey your parents in the Lord. Uh, but it says, obey your parents in the Lord. It says, for this is wrong. No, this is right. It says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. 
I, I really liked it when I looked it up on the Amplified Bible because the Amplified Bible gives, gives a, a, uh, an explanation of what this means, what it means to, to obey your parents in the Lord. What does that mean, to obey your parents in the Lord? And, and so they put this bracket in there. And this is their explanation, which, after I read it, I realized that this is Adventist belief, and yet this is not an Adventist version of the Bible, but this is the Amplified uh, Bible. And they add the following in brackets. They say, uh, to obey your parents in the Lord is this, accept their guidance and discipline. Accept their guidance and discipline as, and then it has uh, capital H as his representatives. In other words, as God's representatives. In other words, your parents, if you're a, ch if you're a young person, your parents are representatives of God to you. And if you're a parent, uh, your children, when they look to you, up to a certain age, up to the age of accountability, up to the age when they begin to make their own choices between right and wrong, up to that age when they look at you, they are actually, hopefully, looking at an image of God in you. Hopefully when they see you, they see your actions, your conversations, the w way that you treat people, the way that you treat your brothers and sisters at church, the way that you, 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 know, you spend time in the Word. When they see you, hopefully they see Jesus Christ. Because that's what it means. So if you obey your parents in the Lord, what you are doing is you're accepting the fact that they are representatives of God here on this earth before you as a child. And if you're a parent, then you should accept this fact because God will ask you, where are the children that I gave you? It's not the pastor's responsibility to raise your children. It's not the Sabbath school teacher's responsibility to raise your children. That's just a supplement to what you should be doing at home with your children. Because in the eyes of God, you stand as a representative of God in your home. You are responsible. It doesn't matter if you are a single parent or if you are married. It doesn't matter, you know, any of that. If you had children, if you multiplied, uh, even under the wrong motives, you are still responsible before the Lord. And that is exactly what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. If you want a quotation, you can come up to me later and I can give you a copy of that. So what about after the age of accountability? What about after the children are old enough to decide between right and wrong? What about once they begin to, you know, have a mind of their own? What about when they're getting to their teenage years? And you know what happens then because we've all gone through it as adults. We've been through it and we know that those are difficult times. However, what happens then? Do you just allow them to do whatever they want to do? Do you reverse the roles and they, they become in control and they're the ones in authority and, and uh, they're the ones telling you what to do and you accept everything they say? I want to take you to another example in the scriptures which we usually don't think about when we think, uh, talk or think about these things. But it's in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Uh, 
51 and 52. Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verses 51 and 52. Now, before we read it, you know the story. Jesus himself, uh, when he turned 12 years old, he went to Jerusalem with his parents to celebrate the Passover. They had to wait until they were 12 to go to Jerusalem with their parents. What a great opportunity this was. Jesus goes, and he is there in Jerusalem, and uh, he's participating of all the festivities. And then on the way back, his parents, Mary and Joseph, think that he is with them, with the crowds, because, I mean, these were big crowds of relatives and friends. Every year they went, they formed this caravan, and they're thinking, well, Jesus is with us. You know, he's probably playing around with all the other kids not realizing that Jesus is not with them. And then they begin to search for him. They cannot find him. They go back to Jerusalem. Three days later, they find Jesus in the temple. And he's having a theological discussion with the priests. And the priests are very interesting. He realizes at that age who he is, where he came from, because he is telling them, you know, it's important for, for me to be in my father's house and in the affairs of my father. And so he knows who he is. He understands where he had come from. He is beginning to open up. He's beginning to grow. He's a preteen. We never think of Jesus as a preteen, but here we have a preteen. Here we have a junior. And he is in that difficult age of most kids understanding that he had come from the Father, understanding, beginning to, you know, those things are beginning to be disclosed before him. He's beginning to accept this. He understands the scriptures. And, uh, and so here, here we find Jesus, and this is where we're going to pick it up. And this is after, you know, his parents ask him, what have you done to us? Don't you know that we're looking for you? And, uh, and then he's like, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Wasn't that obvious to you that this is where you would find me because this is what I came to do? This is my thing. And they don't understand what that means. But, but this is the very interesting thing that happens here. This is, this is God in the flesh. This is the immortal creator of the universe, and he is beginning to open up, and, and he is at that age where he is like, he understands what's coming. And yet what he does is amazing. It says, verse 51, and he, Jesus, went down with them and came to Nazareth. In other words, he went back home with them. Not only that, it says, and he continued, because he was doing this prior, says he continued, in my version says, in subjection. In other versions, like the King James says, he, he was subject himself. He subjected himself uh, to them, to his parents. And his mother treasured all of these things in her heart. This is, this is very interesting because it says that he subjected himself. Jesus, knowing who he was, knowing where he had come from, knowing that he knew probably more than his parents just simply because he is God himself in the flesh, willingly subjects himself to, their, to them. And I had to look up the definition of being a subject or subjection and it is very interesting when we read the definition the definition is when you are a subject or you're in subjection to someone else it says under their authority and control he willingly plays himself at 12 years old preteen jesus he willingly subjected himself he placed himself again under their authority and control, even though they did not understand at that point what he was talking about. I hope that you find this just as mind-blowing as I did. 
He was willing to be and to follow their discipline, their guidance, their instruction. What a great example for us today. What a great example for you parents today. This is 12 years old Jesus subjecting himself. Even though he knew who he was, he's like, I'm going to, I am your son. I live at home. You are my parents. Uh, I live under your roof. I will follow your instructions. I will subject myself to your discipline. I will obey you when you call me. I will do the things you ask me to do. You are in control. I am not in control. If you don't see love in this, then you're missing the point because all I see is love. Jesus loving his earthly parents. Being, you know, just wanting to be under their authority. And the result is interesting because, and this is, I think, for everybody, for every child who accepts the fact that it is your parents who should be in control and not yourself, there is a, a blessing for those children, regardless of your age, if you're still living at home, there is a blessing for you here. And we read it in verse 52. And it says this, And Jesus, because he was willing to subject himself to his parents, willing to accept their authority and control, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. In other words, Jesus experienced growth because he was willing to submit himself to his parents' authority when he was a child. He grew in so many ways. He grew mentally, he grew physically, and he grew communally because he had the favor of those around him. I believe that any child who accepts his parents' responsibility, who accepts his parents' authority, who accepts his parents' control, not control for the sake of hurting you, but for the sake of protecting you, I believe that you will also be blessed by God mentally, physically, and communally. People will respect you more if they realize that you are respectful and obedient to your parents than if they realize otherwise. God will bless your mind so that you will uh, understand the subjects in school, so that you will grow as a wholesome individual. And I'm sure that he will bless you in all respects. I don't think that this is just a blessing for Jesus because he was the son of God. He understood that he was still living at home. He understood that while he still lived at home, his parents were the authority figure, and he was willing to submit himself to that. If you are a parent, do not allow the roles to be switched or reversed because you miss out on the blessings that come with following what the Scripture says. I'm going to skip some stuff, but I'm going to take you to our last text. And in this text, I'm going to uh, take the liberty of changing some words in the text. But since I'm telling you ahead of time, and since I hope that you look it up yourselves,
I just wanted you to come up here, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. I needed your emotional support and your words of advice, because I would have never realized there were two switches. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. We're gonna continue uh, preaching. Might as well take this ugly, uncomfortable tape off, since it's not working. But we're gonna continue here, because this is important, uh, and obviously somebody's upset because it's important. Now, we're going to the Gospel of Mark, I tell you, this is going to be our last verse. Gospel of Mark chapter 8. And I told you that I'm going to change some words. Don't worry. You're here. And you will understand, I hope. Mark chapter 8, verse 36, a verse that we know very well, but that we usually do not apply it to everybody. But let's read it first as it reads in the scripture. It says, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and what? And loses or forfeits his soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul. Now, I want to change some words like I told you, and I'm going to do it, uh, change it like this. For what does it profit a parent? What does it profit a parent if his or her children gain the whole world and yet they lose their soul? What does it profit you if your child is popular? What does it profit you if your child becomes a famous scientist? What does it profit you if your child becomes a brain surgeon? What does it profit you if your child becomes a famous athlete? What does it profit you if your child becomes like one of the wisest men or women in the world? if they lose their soul. Did you gain anything out of that? Was that a good investment? If we invest in the things of this world, our rewards will only be temporary and very short-lived at that. But if we invest in the things above, our rewards will be eternal. Do not allow society to tell you how to raise your children. Do not allow the world to tell you how to raise your children. Do not allow other churches to tell you how to raise your children. Listen to what God says. Do what God says, and you will be blessed in the process. The most important thing that you can give your children, besides an education, is a education for a lifetime. And that one is more important than an earthly education at that. If you cannot afford to give your child an education, at least educate them in the way that they should go. So that when they are old, they will not depart from it. And talking about that verse in Proverbs where it says, you know, train up a child in the way that he should go or she should go. You know, it's train up a child. It's your responsibility to train the child in the way that they should go. It's not the church's responsibility. It's not the pastor's responsibility. It's not your church member's responsibility. We do what we can. Sometimes we do pretty good. Sometimes we uh, come short. But it is your responsibility as a God-fearing father and mother to raise your children 
in the way that they should go, in the way of righteousness, in the way, the path of Jesus Christ, the heavenward path and not the earthward path. So what are you investing in? What are you investing in? Do you want your children to honor you? Like the fifth word says, honor your father and your mother. It's important for you to not neglect your responsibilities. As you have seen, we cannot talk about children honoring their parents before we talk about parents raising their children in the right way, the right path. Now, should all children honor their parents? Most definitely. Regardless of how you were brought up, you should honor your parents. Nobody receives a how-to manual when you have children. And some of us, as children, were horrible. And we had loving parents, and we were still horrible. And so, you know, bless God bless parents throughout because they have a really difficult challenge in their hands. But the way that parents honor God is by accepting their responsibility in guiding and lovingly disciplining their children in the Lord. May the Lord help us as a church, as families, to accept that responsibility. To continue to be a parent, to continue to uphold the scriptures, to continue to be a, an example of Christ to your children, regardless of their age. If, that is, if this is your desire, I would ask you to Stand up with me as we close with prayer. Our Father, we are thankful for guiding us in our study today. I want to pray especially for all the parents here today especially those with young children, especially those with children still living at home. Father, strengthen them. Encourage them. Encourage them to stand by your word and to discipline and love and to remain in control of their households. Help us as a church also to be there for them even if it is simply through our prayers. And we thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for his example. We thank you for your grace, which is ever so abundant and free. Please encourage us the rest of this holy day. It is our prayer believing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. You are now dismissed.